Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. In this video, I'll be doing a stock analysis on one of the biggest and most well-known companies in the world, Google. I'll be taking Google through my initial checklist to see if it's a high quality compounder. And at the end of the video, I try to value Google to see if it's at an attractive price relative to its intrinsic value. So let's get into it. So Google, also known as Alphabet, is probably the most well-known company in the world today. And it's also one of the largest with a market cap of over $1.5 trillion. Google's had an amazing run since its IPO in 2004, compounding by about 23% a year over its 18 year history. The company was founded by Larry Page and Sergey Brin, who were computer science graduates from Stanford University. And it created Google because they wanted to create a service that instantly provides relevant information on virtually any topic. Over time, Google has evolved massively, but the culture within has stayed consistent. In their first letter to shareholders back in 04, Larry says immediately that Google is not a conventional company and they don't intend to become one. They always had a firm focus on the long term. And in this same letter, they wrote a huge paragraph detailing how they're a business fixated on the long term and how they won't be pandering to investors or Wall Street analysts only looking at the next quarter. Larry even quotes the great Warren Buffett and says, we won't smooth quarterly or annual reports. If earnings are lumpy when they reach headquarters, they'll be lumpy when they reach you. One of the best parts to me as a long-term investor is when he says they also won't give earnings guidance because short-term targets distract management and are as pointless as a diet or stepping on scales every half an hour. So looking back at the early days, we can see Google is a unique business with a strong focus on the long-term and a distaste for Wall Street analysts. If you're analyzing a business, it's good to go back to the beginning and see how their initial goals and statements match how they've evolved and progressed. And are they still the same company as they were back then? Obviously they've evolved dramatically with the rise of internet and they've widened their original search business with a broad range of new businesses, services and acquisitions. They even created a parent company to oversee their growing number of businesses, which they named Alphabet. It gets confusing because Alphabet's ticker symbol is Google. So when I say Google, I actually mean Alphabet because Alphabet are the public company and Google are just a part of that company. But everyone knows them as Google, so that's what I'm gonna keep calling them. In a recent interview with Peking University, Monish Pabrai unveiled his new framework for analyzing multibaggers. And one of the main categories he spoke about are something called spawners. He gave a few examples of businesses that could be considered a spawner. And he breaks it down even further into different categories of spawners, with the best one being an apex spawner. It's a great lecture, and if you're an active investor, I highly recommend checking it out. But the one I want to talk about today, uh, which is uh, part of the renaissance this year, is the spawners. And the spawners are companies that, that continuously spawn related and unrelated businesses. Very few companies have the DNA to be great spawners. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll drill down a little bit on the different kinds of spawners. And uh, basically, these are companies that have a deep conviction of, and really it's part of the DNA, to keep adding and incubating new businesses that have the potential to be massive growth engines. They expect many of these things to fail, and they take failure in their stride. So Google is one of the businesses that Monish identified as an apex spawner, a business that creates and acquires new businesses to enhance the underlying business. With Google, they spawned or acquired YouTube, Waymo, Google Cloud, Fitbit, and Android. Most of Google's bets have paid off and have become important sources of revenue and earnings, especially YouTube. In their early letters, they talk extensively about spawning and how they'll consistently venture far outside their current business for projects if they see opportunities. They even have an initiative where they encourage employees to spend 20% of their working time on any project they like that they think will most benefit Google. So essentially, that means they get one full work day a week to work on their own projects with full access to Google's resources and capital. This is genius when you think about it. Think about how many really bright people with their own great ideas work at big tech and think about how many of them might consider leaving to pursue their own ideas and create their own startup. At Google, they're encouraged to pursue their own projects within the company, and Google will even fund the project. Larry says AdSense and Google News were both prototyped in what they call 20% time, and even the ones that fail can teach them something. So Google's definitely an interesting business, and they seem to have a very strong focus on the long term, which is what I'm looking for in a business. Now, let's put Google through my checklist to see if it's a high quality compounder. First up, we'll look at their return on capital employed over the last 10 years. For the most part, Google's return on capital employed is pretty good over the last decade, reaching 20% this past year and roughly 15% on average. Next, we need to look at the return on incremental capital and the reinvestment rate. And as usual, I have the 10-year, the 5-year and the 1-year filled out. 
If we look at the 10 year first, the results are very impressive. Their new incremental capital was 257 billion, and that incremental capital generated an additional 55 billion in earnings, which works out to be a 22% return on incremental capital employed. To get the reinvestment rate, we need our 10 year cumulative free cash flow, which I got by adding up the last 10 years of free cash flow on QuickFS. This came to 267 billion, and if we compare that to the incremental capital, we get our reinvestment rate, which is 98% which is exactly what you want to see from a business achieving 20% returns on capital. And finally, to get the intrinsic value compounding rate, we just multiply the reinvestment rate by the return on incremental capital employed, which gives us a compounding rate of 21% a year, which over a 10 year period is brilliant. Now, if we look at the five year, it's pretty similar. 25% return on incremental capital, an 86% reinvestment rate, which gives us a 22% value compounding rate. So strong results again over the medium term. Finally, we'll look at the one year to see how they go on the short term now that the cash is really starting to pile up. Their return on incremental capital is a massive 67%. This is mainly because the juggernaut that is Google is well and truly in motion and past bets are now starting to pump out free cash flow. This means any incremental capital invested back in the business is likely going to generate large returns on capital because they currently don't need that much additional capital to maintain their current growth. Based on what they've mentioned in letters, I assume most of their incremental capital is going towards new projects that we might not see results in for a few years. Next, if we look at the reinvestment rate, we can see it's gone down quite a bit to around 50%. This isn't that surprising. Because they've grown so massive and produced so much free cash flow each year, they can't possibly invest it all back into the business. After all, with their core business model, which is advertising, they can only reinvest a finite amount of incremental capital to grow. Unfortunately, they can't just use all that cash to expand their search business or YouTube or their advertising business. If they could reinvest 100% of their earnings back into the business and earn a 67% return on capital, they probably would. It's still a remarkable business, but it has its limitations when they become as big as Google has. If they weren't spawning new businesses or funding employee projects, they'd probably have a reinvestment rate much lower than they do now because of that limitation. With that said, it's not a bad place for a business to be. Having a 50% reinvestment rate and a 67% return on capital employed, their intrinsic value still compounded by around 36% year on year. Not to mention they still have 50% of their earnings left over, which management can use to create value for shareholders in other ways, like share buybacks or dividends. In Google's 10K, management said they don't pay dividends, and their primary use of capital is to invest for the long term. And over the last few years, they've opted to use excess capital to repurchase shares, spending around $50 billion in buybacks in 2021 alone. So overall, Google's a great business. And over the last 10 plus years, they've definitely been a high quality compounder. And any investors who held the business for the last decade would have been greatly rewarded. So the question going forward is, can they keep compounding for the next 10 or 20 years? And how long is the runway for this business? Just because they performed really well in the past doesn't mean it will continue into the future. As a business, Google makes over 80% of their revenue from ads and even more so in earnings and free cash flow. I'm sure this will continue into the future, but how long is the runway for the advertising business and how much more can it grow? I think Google Cloud will succeed and do well, but how will it compete with other big players like AWS, Azure, and Alibaba Cloud? And for Waymo, they're competing with many companies, including Tesla on autonomous driving and ride sharing. Before I keep going, this entire video is just my subjective assessment of Google, based on my understanding of the business and my circle of competence. The numbers in the spreadsheets are facts, but my interpretation of them is not. I could be completely wrong about the future of Google, and I probably am, but based on my circle of competence and my understanding of the business, for me there's too much uncertainty, and it's a business where I'm not completely confident they have a long runway to grow. It's definitely a quality business, and it's definitely been a compounder for the last decade, but I'm just not entirely sure that it will continue to compound for the next 10 or 20 years. Again, I want to stress that I'm not an expert on Google, and I'm probably wrong. Google's definitely a cool company, and it'll be super interesting to follow them to see what they do next with their massive resources. But I have to separate my interest in the company and what I look for in an investment. I'm also not 100% sure about the management team either. If you're interested, I'll leave a good article in the description below about the downfall of Larry and Sergi. But I won't waste your time talking about the drama involving management in this video, otherwise we'll be here all day. So all in all, to use the baseball term that Buffett uses, it's not the pitch I want to swing at because it's not in my sweet spot. If the valuation went to some crazy levels, maybe I'd reconsider, like if it was trading for 40 or 50 cents on the dollar. But at normal bull market levels, it's a pass from me right now. 
Just to be sure it wasn't massively undervalued, I did a quick valuation of Google using a discounted cash flow. If you're new here, every spreadsheet I use will be linked below in the description box if you want to use them yourself. So because I don't have the best understanding of Google and each of its business segments, I used pretty conservative estimates for the growth rates. I used 10% for the first five years and 8% for the following five. This is probably way too low, but even with these low estimates, Google will still produce around 160 billion in free cash flow by 2031, up from around 70 billion now. As always, I used a discount rate of 10%. And for the terminal multiple, I used a multiple of 15 because of their low growth but decent return on capital. This gives us an intrinsic value estimate for the entire business of around 1.5 trillion. And with 658 million shares outstanding, it gives us a fair value of around $2,400 a share. That's my basic and probably incorrect valuation estimate for Google. And if I wanted a dollar for 50 cent or less, I'd have to pay less than $1,200 a share for Google. So that's my initial analysis for Google. And based on the results, it's currently not a business on my radar to invest in. It's definitely a cool company, which I'll follow closely. And I love most of their products, especially YouTube. I've personally learned so much from YouTube. And it's also given me a platform to share my thoughts and ideas with you guys. So it's not my lack of love for the business. It's just not in my sweet spot as an investment. Please don't take this as a buy or sell recommendation on the stock. This analysis was primarily about the company itself and its fundamentals. And my valuation was based off very conservative estimates and is probably way off. If there's any other businesses you want me to analyze, or if you have any questions, then let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video and you want to support the channel, I'd really appreciate if you hit that like button. And if you want to see more videos like this one or join our community, then hit that subscribe button. And if you're still bored, I'll put another video up in the corner that I think you'll like. And as always, this video is not financial advice and I'm not a financial advisor. So please always do your own research before making any investment decisions. So that's it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.